Well, good morning. I think everyone can hear me. Do I need to hold this? All right. Give me a second. Okay. Well, welcome to Calvary Bible Church. Um, I have some a few announcements here this morning. And uh, first of all, we've got our budget meeting today after the service. So if you are a voting member, please plan on staying. Uh, we are looking around trying to figure out if we're going to have quorum. We need 18 for quorum. So if you're a voting member, please plan on staying so that we can finally approve the budget. Uh, and if we don't have quorum, we're going to have to make it up as we, as we go. So uh, after the meeting then, also if we could get some volunteers to stay and help uh, organize the uh, area for Dale DeMar's memorial service, which is next Saturday. So if you have a few minutes, we need to put some chairs away and put up some tables so that we can get ready for that service for next week. Uh, Marvin it will be coordinating that effort. So afterwards, if you want to help and you just need to know what goes where, uh, Marvin is the guy to ask. Uh, we have four tickets, not to Paradise, but to the Ark. So if anyone would want to go to the Ark, we have four tickets here. Uh, they were Kayla Muse. She wasn't able to use them, so she's wondering if anybody would be able to use them. There is, you can upgrade them, but there is two youth tickets. Kids 10 and under are free, so there are two youth tickets where, which are... I, th I believe from ages 10 to 18, there's an adult ticket and a senior ticket. But Kay uh, did tell me that we could, you could upgrade these tickets uh, either way. So if you were able to use them, the kicker is they expire uh, next Saturday. So you have to use them before the 16th. But if you can use them, uh, if you're able to uh, just pack up and go for the day, uh, see me afterwards. I have these tickets and they will be yours. They are free, of course. Uh, that's all the announcements I have. Dale, come on up. And I almost, I almost walked away with that. <laughs> Good morning. Would you stand with me, please? We're going to start by singing hymn number 339, Since I Have Been Redeemed. We're going to sing all three stanzas there. I have a song I love to sing since I have been redeemed. My Redeemer, Savior, King, since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in His name, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. A second, please. I have a Christ who satisfies since I have been redeemed to his will my highest trust since I have been redeemed since I have been redeemed since I have been redeemed I will glory in his name since I have been redeemed I will glory in my Savior's name and third please I have a witness bright and clear since I have been redeemed. Confelling every doubt and fear since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed. I will glory in His name since I have been redeemed. I will glory in my Savior. Fourth is the last, please. I have a home prepared for me since I have been redeemed. Where I shall dwell eternally since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed. I will glory in His name. Since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. Let's go one more place to 452. Make me a blessing. We'll sing all three stanzas. Amen. 
out in the highways and byways of life. Many are weary and sad, carry the sunshine where darkness is bright, making the sorrowing glad. Make me a blessing, make me a blessing. service this morning as well with prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are God, that there is you and no other. Indeed, hallowed be your name, and Father, your kingdom come and your will be done. Father, I thank you this morning for the opportunity to gather with those of like faith, to have the freedom to come together and to worship you worship you in song, worship you in fellowship, worship you in prayer, worship in the study of your word. Father, in light of that, I pray for our government. Father, there, this is a very confusing world for many, many tough decisions to be made. Father, I pray that on all levels that our leaders will seek you seek your will, will pursue righteousness and goodness according to your word. Father, I think of those among us who are ill, are struggling physically. I pray, Father, that you will grant them your grace, that even in suffering, that they will radiate a love, a trust and surrender to your will that will radiate and be a wonderful testimony for you. I pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world as well that are persecuted, where they do not share the freedom to worship you publicly. I pray for their families. I pray for courage. I pray as well, Father, for our courage. We live in a land that is very blessed Yet there is so much gray where it's so easy, so convenient 
to get distracted from the mission that you have called us to as ambassadors for your kingdom. I pray that you will give us an intensity of focus in that. That, Father, we will prioritize our lives to place you first, to seek to serve you full time in contest with nothing else, regardless the cost. Father, I pray that you will also give us the courage and the willingness to look at our lives. And Father, if our lives are not in alignment with your word, that through your grace, we will have the willingness to repent, to course correct, so that we may be salt and light for you. Father, we think of Pastor Ed as he's teaching this morning. I pray that your Holy Spirit will guide his thoughts, guide his words, and guide our hearts. We again thank you for this opportunity. In your son's name I pray. Amen. Don't from his glory Jesus was his name, born in a manger, to his own a stranger, a man of sorrows, tears, and agony.
Thank you, John. Would you stand with me again, please, before, before Pastor Ed comes? We're going to sing a couple of songs. Let's go to uh, hymn number 69, Thy Loving Kindness. Thy loving kindness is better than life. Thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee. I will lift up my hands unto thy name. I lift my hands, Lord, unto thy name. I lift my hands, Lord, unto thy name. My lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee. I will lift up my hands unto thy name. One more, let's sing Great is Thy Faithfulness. Hymn number 43, please, all three stanzas. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath grown. morning. If you have your Bibles, we'll be in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32 today. The last time I preached was before the pandemic, so it's been a while. And uh, when I fill in once in a while now from Pastor Lee, I want to continue in this series of one another's. Uh, I want to remind you of the cultural need for these exhortations this morning as well. You know, we live in a culture that is completely self-focused. Everything is about us. Our worldview continues to teach us that if it does not benefit us, then perhaps it's a waste of time. Interestingly enough, Americans have to deal with many Bible verses that speak to the idea of community, 
to the local church. For example, the familiar verses out of Philippians 2 says, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if in any affliction and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. I know we've heard these types of verses many times, and they roll off our tongues, and we're familiar with them. But how often do we really consider the needs of others? Well, maybe we do within our families, right? We have ourselves and our family units. But this exhortation is written to the church with a much wider expectation. How often do we consider the needs of others in the church? Perhaps even this morning as I'm speaking this, someone's saying, yeah, what about my needs? If we did consider others, there would be far less needs in our community. People wouldn't be lonely. How often do we call widows and widowers or involve them in the things, other things of the church? How often do people suffer through major life issues by themselves? We just don't live in a world like that, do we? We're very autonomous. And when we have commands of scripture like this, we have lots of good excuses. For example, everyone is so busy. I'm busy. You're busy. We're busy doing our own thing. While this is true, it doesn't make it right. Or perhaps you could say, well, isn't that church stuff the pastor's work? Well, I'd say, well, no. If you read Acts 6, pastors got certain roles and other roles go to other people. And then widen that to Ephesians 4, where we all have gifts of the Spirit, and we're all supposed to be encouraging and maturing one another. So, that's a hard message to hear. No wonder why churches who don't preach that get bigger, right? Uh, they tell people to come to our church, and we'll meet their needs. Come and enjoy the show, and you can completely keep your individuality. Where small churches, we're saying, hey, we need you. We can't grow without you. Spiritually, that is, in every other way as well. This is why the one another passages should be important to us. That is, our church, in our culture, in this time. Almost in every one of the one another uh, uh, paragraphs, uh, the sentence is, the one another challenge is coupled with an imperative verb. Thus, they're not supposed to be optional. They are the commands of God for his people. If you remember last time, for example, uh, I preached on 1 Thessalonians 5.11 and says we were to encourage one another. This command showed us that humans have needs. Our world is not necessarily an encouraging place. Thus Christians are to take the time to take care of each other and to encourage each other. Be reminded that no one is supposed to be called a discourager. No one has a spiritual gift of discouragement, right? So if you're not actively encouraging other Christians, then you're not being obedient to the commands of God. Because this is the way God made us. We need each other. Uh, we need to continue to mature in our faith. If we continue down the path of being self-centered, we're going to plateau at our faith and uh, maybe even become ineffectual for God's use. In our lesson today, we'll be exploring another one of these one one another passages. Let's look at Ephesians 4, 32, just to get it started, and then we'll come back to it as I introduce many things. Ephesians 4, 32 says, And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. The first thing I want to do is talk about just the way all of our Bibles translate this. I went through many translations, and... Uh, they miss a few things. Uh, first of all, it sounds like the command here is to be kind to one another, and then tender-hearted and forgiving is kind of tacked on. That's not true. The imperative here is to be. We're going to talk about that in more depth in a minute. To be to one another. 
And then three things. Kind, tender, hearted, and forgiving. So to be is an important concept. We are to be. That, is mean, that means who you are intrinsically. So if I was to ask you who you are this morning, you might say, well, I'm Johnny or I'm Sally. Well, that's our given names, but we're more than that. Perhaps if you push a little deeper, you might say, well, I'm a mother of two, or I'm the father and I'm a mechanic. And that's great, too. That describes what you do, what your vocations are, but it doesn't describe who you are. I see we have some younger people today. They maybe will laugh at this, but when you're younger, people want to have a persona that I'm a crazy guy or I'm a cool guy, right? Or I'm a girl who just wants to have fun or I want to be good at sports. Of course, you can tell who they think they are by how they act, right? Don't you love it when you see people walking around with unusual things, all trying to be a certain prosana. That's who they think they are. Well, there's some more sophisticated ways or more normal ways. Perhaps you think that your hobby is who you are. Have you ever known like a golfer or a bowler and they're pretty good? They like to be known as being pretty good, don't they? Uh, maybe if you're a bowler, you got to be in a league three times a week. Why do you have to be in a league three times a week? because you get better and better and better. This is who I'm supposed to be. You spend your time, energy, and money because I, this is who I am, or at least that's who you think you are. What about your wife and kids? Don't they need you? What about your ministry at the local church? Yes, all that's true, but it's all secondary because I'm busy. I'm a bowler. Can we see the mixed priorities here? Someone who is a bowler and a Christian will continue to struggle to live out their Christian life because they're putting their time and energy and money and all they have into something else first. My thesis this morning about this larger idea of to be is you have to, one must be before one can do. It sounds kind of basic, but I want to grab that this morning. One must be before they can do. We're always looking for something to do. We're supposed to be doing. How many people here today can say they struggle with some of the same sins throughout their whole life? They just cannot seem to overcome them. It could be that they're not living out what God made them to be. How about some other scriptures that has the idea of be? How about Matthew 5? Be perfect, just like your heavenly Father. Doesn't really tell you to do, does it? How about 1 Peter 1.16? Be holy, for I am holy. Notice the text does not say, you need to go out and do a bunch of holy things. It says you need to be holy. Then you will want to do. That's what the idea here is. But back to our text. We have a, a be verb also. Right in verse 32. Again, this is not something that we try to do. We're not going to one day have a bad day and the next day go out and say, all today I'm going to try so hard to be kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving. He tell, he's telling us to be these things. And by the way, we already have everything it takes to fulfill these commandments. We don't need more, do we? If you're in the book of Ephesians, uh, click over to page uh, chapter 1. In the middle of Paul's prayer, just catch verse 18 for a moment. I like as Paul prays these prayers, you pick up on what he's thinking. He's asking for a lot of things here. He says, he asked for the Ephesians that their eyes of their understanding may be enlightened. That you may know what is the hope of your calling. And what are the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints. He's asking for them to realize, to be illumined, their minds be opened up to what they already have. He's not asking for them to have more. He's saying you already have this and you can just understand these things. So to be means uh, this is what our essential nature is. This is a description of who a Christian really is. Now I will grant that there are times that we must learn these things, right? We have that wonderful uh, illustration of Paul in Philippians 4 where he says he's, he learned to be content. 
How many people here today can say they're perfectly content? Paul says he learned to be content in every state, whether rich or poor, whether full or empty. So we can learn these traits more about being as were our eyes illumined. Also, I should mention back in our verse here, chapter 4, verse 32, the verb be is in the imperative sense, which means it uh, has the idea of a continuous action. So our being is to be every day. We're not supposed to try to do one day and then not do the next day and then do the next day. This is who we're supposed to be ongoing. Well, perhaps this morning someone here might say, why? Why should the Christian be anything? Well, let's back it up a little bit. Uh, verse 32, obviously, is the conclusion to chapter 4. So let's look at verse 1 of chapter 4. Paul says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. That's a strong ethical pull, isn't it there? He's saying you had a calling and you should walk worthy. You should live worthy of your calling. Of course, Paul's calling here refers to the call to salvation. In chapters 1 to 3, that is outlined. But let's look at just chapter 1, because we can see that in the Trinity here. I'll read some of this, but not a lot of it, but a little bit. Chapter 1, we see our calling our call to salvation worked out in the Trinity. First of all, God the Father, in verses 3 to 6. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us uh, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of his glory and his grace by which he made us acceptable in the beloved. So first we see that God the Father chose us and predestined us. God the Father is the one who plans all of history. He knows the beginning from the end. He stands outside of time because he created all of time. And for his own reason he chose us he has a plan, and his plan will go forward. Now, this is a hard saying for some of us to hear, but it was not hard for the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul was overwhelmed by God that he came down and called him on that road to Damascus. Paul was in total rebellion against Jesus, yet Jesus appeared to him and called him. Now, our calling might not seem as dramatic as the Apostle Paul's, but it is just as important. Think about it for a moment. How much God loves you. God calls you. God has a plan for you to fit into his plan. If we would meditate upon that concept, I think it would overwhelm us. The Almighty God, the one who created all things, has called us. I find this truth amazing, sometimes incomprehensible. Well, that's the first part of the Trinity. The second part is God the Son. And there's a long section there, but I think I'll just pick up on verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood for the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. In Jesus we have redemption. While the Father chose us, Jesus came to earth and took on human flesh and became a sacrifice for us. He paid for our sins and redeemed us. When we could do nothing, we were helpless and broke. Again, isn't that amazing? We have been redeemed when we had no power of our own. Jesus took the punishment, that is the very wrath of God, for our sins. And then the third part of the Trinity is in verse 13 and 14, the Holy Spirit. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the, re the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So we were sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. God the Father chose us, Jesus the Son redeemed us, 
and the Holy Spirit seals us so that our salvation is secure. This is one amazing calling, isn't it? Well, Paul pulls on this calling back in chapter 4, right? To motivate us, to live like we're supposed to be. You're an adopted child of God. You are a new creation in 2 Corinthians 5. Romans 8, we're supposed to be Come more and more Christ-like. That's the goal. Are you starting to see who you really are this morning? You're not a bowler who is a Christian. You are a Christian first and foremost. This truth then directs how we live. It guides us to prioritize all the things in our lives. Paul says in four one to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. The life that we're supposed to be living is spelled out all throughout the New Testament. But chapter 4 adds a lot today. Too much to preach on the whole chapter. We're just going to preach on the last verse here eventually. But uh, right away, if you get in chapter 4, he starts out with just bang, a bunch of things. Bang, 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 bang. You should be living this way. You should, this is how you should be living. And then I love the, it gets down a little further. He talks about diversity of spiritual gifts. That's also important in our calling. We all have blind spots. God makes us all differently. So we're meant to be a church. We're meant to function as a body. Uh, so that's, again, that's part of living the life, is living within church, living with the community. I like to say that God has called no lawn rangers. God is not called for a ramble. He's called for you to be part of a church. Perhaps the most instructive section as we get through here on chapter 4, verses 20 to 24. Let's take a moment to read those. We're in Ephesians 4, 20 to 24. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conduct the old man which grows corrupt, according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. That's an interesting section here to me. We're to put off the old man, that is the old way of life, its old habits, and put on the new man. We're supposed to live out who we're supposed to be in Christ. This is kind of uh, the work that's been put back upon us. Now, of course, God's included in that as well. But the challenge comes back to us. So this means that our life needs to be intentional. We cannot go through life in neutral and assume we're going to be living a godly, holy life. If we're in neutral, the world will always want to guide us to its message. And we naturally follow it. If we keep going in this chapter a little bit later, if we're not living out who we're supposed to be in our calling, do you know that you can actually grieve the Holy Spirit? Look at verse 30. It says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. When we live like the world and not like how we're supposed to be living, we actually grieve the Holy Spirit. That thought alone ought to get us thinking about how we are living. Finally, let's get to our verse, which we now have introduced for half the sermon, back to verse 32, where Paul tells us how we ought to be a certain way. Our verse is, one again, one of those one another verses. That's why I chose it this morning. Uh, it also indicates... Uh, Again, about being in relationship with others. That's part of the Christian walk. He says we are to be kind, tender-hearted, and forgiving. But before we can be any of these three things, again, we must put off the old man, right? Look at verse 31. Paul's good with lists. He says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. That's a lot of things to be put away, isn't it? 
He's saying if you're living that way, you're living according to the old man. He says, put those things off. You cannot be kind and tenderhearted and forgiving if you're bitter, angry, or full of wrath. These are the attitudes and actions of the world. When we're practicing these things, we are living in the flesh and not being led by the Holy Spirit. You know, even good Christians can struggle with these types of life, old life issues, right? We may, never, we may say, that, oh, I'm never unkind. But I was thinking about that. Uh, how about in a moment when you're impatient? I would say, I'm never impatient, but my wife's sitting there and she could tell you quite differently. Those are the moments you may not be kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving, right? Also, I should mention that uh, it is, it's simply not natural to be kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving. It's not a default mold in our life, especially when we're fa facing some sort of trials. The reaction of our old man are natural and even understood by others. You won't be judged if you live that way most of the time. Everyone seems to understand when you're angry at a bad event or when you speak evil of others. There's nothing more prevalent as a sin in the local church than gossip and slander. However, God expects us to live that life which he made us for. Finally, let's, let's examine these three concepts a little closer. We are to be kind. The word for kind is translated in many different ways in the New Testament. The most common way that this word is translated is good. We are to be kind or we are to be good. Uh, let me give you a few examples. 1 Corinthians 15, 11. Bad company corrupts good morals. Same word. How about uh, 1 Peter 2, 3? Since you have tasted that the Lord is good. So ideas of kindness and goodness greatly overlap when we're translating from the Greek into the English. One of my favorite uses, I'm going to mention it because it's here, is in Ephesians 2, 7. But let me read 4 through 2, chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. It says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. There's that word kindness that we're supposed to be. Notice that we did not receive the kindness of God because we were deserving. We were dead in our sin. We are most in the most undeserving state. Yet God showed his kindness towards us. So let me tighten up this concept a little bit, just in case we're not all on the same page. Uh, when we put off the old man and put on the new man, we'll become more Christ-like in our actions and in our reactions. So our kindness also will be a supernatural response, not a natural response. If we're going to be like Jesus, we must learn to be a kind person. You know, the supernatural kindness or goodness can have other important results as well. Listen to Romans 2, verse 4. Paul tells us how kindness can lead people to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness or kindness of God leads you to repentance? God's goodness or kindness is supposed to overwhelm us. It is so unexpected. It's really not fair. We should have deserved wrath. Yet God showed us kindness. Then when we honestly come before his throne and we come face to face with him, that's when we want to repent. Have you ever shown such kindness toward anyone? I think that it is easy to be the kind of people who react. You treat me bad, I'll treat you bad. This is the way of the world. But the life in the spirit is different, isn't it? 
Remember Galatians 5, the spirit of, true, the, spirit of the fruit there. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. This type of kindness can only be produced by us when we are filled with the Spirit. Again, it's not natural. It is supernatural. It will make no sense to the ethic of this world. Now let's come back to our calling, and back to our chapter. If we're going to walk worthy of our calling, then we must put off normal responses that mankind makes towards one another and be filled with the Spirit so we can display kindness towards others. Again, I have to ask this morning as we look upon ourselves, hopefully no one here today can say, I'm an unkind person and I'm okay with that. Of course, out in the world, we're going to meet other people, right? Let's be real. People learn to use negativity to get their way. Can we truly learn to display the goodness of God? If we do, it will affect even the negative ones around us. Well, our second attribute here this morning is to be tenderhearted, kind and be tenderhearted a second. This word, of course, is translated figuratively. Uh, it literally means your internal org- organs in the original language. So one might say we are supposed to feel for others at the gut level. Tender-hearted, merciful, compassionate. Now we still use this figurative language in our language. Uh, in the negative today, right, we may say something like, you make me sick to my stomach, right? In other words, I have a disdain for you and your actions. But here, in our context, Christians are to feel inwardly uh, when something goes wrong, we're supposed to be able to empathize with somebody else. We're supposed to be tender-hearted. What are some of the wrong attitudes we might have towards people when something goes bad? Not my problem. They probably deserved it. How about Job's friends in the Bible? You must have done something wrong and now are experiencing the wrath of God. Otherwise, sins have consequences. And while those are true, that's not the gut feeling we're supposed to have as spirit-filled believers. Equally, how about when something goes right for somebody else? We ought to be able to celebrate with them. There are those whose inward being becomes envious or even jealous when someone else gets the recognition. Hopefully, it is not hard for us to be able to enjoy with others or rejoice with others when they are blessed by God. The Apostle Peter also uses this word uh, and he tells us that it can lead to a blessed life. In uh, chapter 3 verses 8 and 9 he says, finally all of you be of one mind having compassion one for another love us brothers be tender-hearted that's our word be tender-hearted be courteous not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, ties it into your calling, that you may inherit a blessing. We are told this, that we are supposed to be tender-hearted as part of our calling. And now Peter even adds further that we'll be blessed for living that life. We're not told what the blessing is exactly, but who doesn't want to be on the blessed side of God. Yet again, in our culture, in our churches, we can see many who persist in chasing after their own self-needs, which in turn require them to be hard-hearted, not tender-hearted. Some are even willing to put down others so they can climb the ladder of success. Are you a tender-hearted person? I kind of smile when I ask that because it doesn't sound very manly, does it, to the men? We don't want to say, oh, I'm a tender-hearted guy. It doesn't sound manly, does it? But you know, if you're a child of God, you can be. And hopefully we realize that these traits are so important to God that he's putting them in Scripture. And since we're adopted in his family, he's saying, I want you to live this way. This is his expected way for us to live. 
not a cultural, manly way to live. All right, we have one more attribute to, to deal with here. Let's transition into our third attribute, to be a forgiving type of person. Interesting, the idea of forgiving is taught all throughout the New Testament. My assumption is that unforgiveness must be a real challenge for some. Perhaps a more natural uh, reaction would be to get angry, to hold a grudge, cut off all communication, maybe even desiring revenge. One might retort and say to me, you don't know how bad this other person is. You don't know how much they've hurt me. And all I can say is, you'd be right, I don't know. But the whole idea about forgiveness is when someone has violated you in some fashion, you show mercy and grace by your forgiveness. This mercy and grace that you extend toward others reflects that you are a changed person and that your lifestyle is being led by the Holy Spirit. Our motivation here is to be like God. Remember the gospel message that when we were wicked and sinful, when we were totally unworthy, when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, God, because of his great love, showed mercy and grace toward us when we needed it most. He sent his son Jesus into this world to die a perfect sacrifice so that all of our sins could be forgiven. There's that word forgiven again. God's forgiveness is a great example. Not only was God the most holy of all beings, he was sinned against. He was sinned against by his own creations, those who he made who were supposed to love him. Not only that, but it was he and he alone who would make a way for forgiveness to be a reality. Now back to us. That person or family member or co-worker or whoever who has wronged us, who has hurt us, who has taken advantage of us. We are to be just like our God and be the ones to take the action and to make a relationship possible. Oh, we have great examples of difficulties in this, though, I know. I've heard people say, yeah, I've done it already. I've, I've tried this once before. How many times do I have to forgive the person? Right? Forgiveness is not always easy. I'll share a story with you, and I'll, I won't give the names. I might change just a few details to protect the innocent. But as you know, I, I, I do work in the hospital as a chaplain. Recently, I've worked with a drug addict. Uh, she lost all that she had because of her, the drugs in her life. She lost her housing. She lost the custody of her children. She ended up living as a prostitute to get money for her drugs. Then one day, she overdosed to the point of death. And uh, she was, it was real bad that time. But by God's grace, she survived and started the healing process of getting better, getting clean again. And after she got clean, she got a small job and started gen generating money again. She moved in with her grandparents so she could be until she got on her feet. But once she started getting a little money and over a little time, the cravings came back, the temptations came back. She started to steal from her grandparents, the very ones who loved her and were her firewall. Eventually, they had to kick her out because she was using their goodwill and their money for evil. Then, when she'd come to a point of hating her sin again, once again, she overdosed, trying to kill herself. Again, God did not allow it to happen. She was in ICU for a week and then in a long-term facility for a stay. She was broken. And now as I, when I worked with her, she did cry out to God with a repentant heart. She confessed all her sins. And I'm sure that God forgave her. But she wanted to repent and confess to her grandparents as well. As a chaplain, we can call the grandparents, but we can't give any details. I would be against HIPAA and all the other things. So, if you were the grandparents this morning, it's been a couple years since you saw your granddaughter, and she'd overdosed again. And she wanted you to come to the hospital to talk to you. Would you go? That's a good question. She'd wronged you. She'd stolen from you. She'd lied to your face. 
Forgiveness is not always easy. Yet we as Christians are called to be like God. We are to be kind and tenderhearted and forgiving, even those who seemingly are undeserving. If you're struggling this morning with being kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving, perhaps you're trying to be someone other than a child of God. So in a short conclusion here today, let me challenge you. Number one, we're called to live a life worthy of our amazing calling. Two, I call you to consider who you really are. If you are being who you're supposed to be, then you can do what you're supposed to do. Being to one another kind, tender-hearted, and forgiving. And remember that if you're a child of God and you're struggling with these things, they can be learned. You can grow in these things. Meditate upon them. Where are you in your walk today? If changes need to be made, this is a great day to start. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your scriptures. We know that they're all important. We thank you for the challenge from them today. And I just pray, Lord, that as each one of us goes out today, that we'll be desirous to be a child of God first and then let all the other things start to fall in line. Help us to be intentional, Lord, about being obedient unto you and unto the Holy Scriptures. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Attend our service this morning. Would you stand with me, please? We're going to sing There's Something About That Name. Hymn number 102. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after Again, thanks for coming this morning. Remember, we do have a meeting right afterwards. If you are a member, please stay. We do have ushers. If you try to leave, they will tackle you in the parking lot and drag you back in. Please stay. Have a good week.